people of God, did your creator hear your cries of agony? Yes, our creator heard our cries and gave us liberation. People of God, did you abandon slavery in Egypt? Yes, we have left our precious time. People of God, are you free? You're invited to stand as you are able and join me in singing our opening hymn. Good morning and welcome to worship here at Claremont United Church of Christ. It is so good to see all of you with us this morning. And welcome to everyone who is worshiping with us online. It's good to see you as well. If you would leave us some contact information in the blue pew pads, you can sign in and pass those down the row. When they get to the end, pass them back the other way. I invite you to be nosy and take a peek and see who your neighbors are in your pew this morning. Maybe greet them by name when we pass the peace of Christ in a moment. And if you're worshiping online, we invite you to sign in as well and let us know who you are. And we would love to reach out and welcome you later this week if you leave us an email or phone number. A couple of announcements. After worship today, we do have brunch church today, and it is an avocado toast bar, very California. So join us for that. Um, Project Angel is collecting baby supplies that they'll be donating to those in need this week and next week as well. So you have one more week to donate those supplies if you are able. Our children's choir is launching today after the worship service, so grades 2nd through 8th. If you have any children in that age group that would like to sing in the choir, we invite you to stay, and you can go to brunch church while they sing in the choir. It's perfect. We have some pick events that are coming up that have spots available. This is one of our annual fundraisers for the church. And so if you're looking to get out and socialize and meet new people and have a great time, check your Friday email. What pick events might have some slots open that you might be able to fill? And um, Another Voice is having a taco bar next week after worship. So if you like tacos, and I don't know anyone who doesn't, um, please consider joining us for that. Another Voice is our LGBTQIA plus and allies group here at the church. On that note, I am going to invite a special guest to give you a special welcome. That is our conference minister, Rachel Pryor. Good morning. It's really my honor and I have to say thank you uh, to Jen and Jacob for this opportunity to very briefly say hello, good morning, um, and thank you really to all of you. I'm Rachel Pryor. I'm the conference minister for the Southern California and Nevada Conference of the United Church of Christ. So you may know that Claremont is part of a national denomination called the United Church of Christ. 
but you may not know that we're also divided into smaller regions, and each of those regions has a conference minister who is primarily um, a, a oversees a small staff and works um, to build relationships with each of our local churches and our clergy. When churches go through search and call, the conference is the primary support. Uh, when ministers, when, when people like you sitting in the pews identify that maybe uh, there's a, a nudge, a call, a sense of ministry as a possible future vocation, the conference and the association, which is the sub-region, are the groups that uh, provide that support and encouragement and accountability and oversight. And we're also a sort of coordinating uh, resource pool and we help um, funnel resources from our national setting around a huge array of issues including accessibility, racial justice, climate justice, um, and lots of other ministries that I know this local church is engaged in. So our, our Southern California Nevada Conference Board was meeting this weekend for our annual retreat. And I also want to acknowledge Mike, who I just saw. Mike Schunemeyer is here, who's another board member just in town from Las Vegas. So we were gathered from all over. Had a really amazing, productive couple of days of conversation. And for that, I want to say thank you for allowing us the generous use of your space to have a, a place to gather. Thank you for your hospitality. Claremont UCC is one of the most generous, maybe in fact the most generous, supporters of the work of this conference. Financial supporters, supporters of ministry resources, leadership, volunteers. So unfortunately, I have to leave at the end of this service, or, or maybe a little bit before, I'm, I'm headed to Joshua Tree, where many of you may know Reverend Dr. Gerald Garber, who passed away recently. Um, he's known in this conference, and he's also known somewhat uh, famously in the UCC as the founder of First Church, Second Life, the first ever virtual congregation of the United Church of Christ. Um, he passed away a couple of weeks ago, so I'm headed to Joshua Tree to officiate for his service, which was a a last minute thing when Christine Eng, who you may also know, was not able to do the service because her daughter had a baby yesterday morning and the baby is healthy and the mother is healthy and the grandmother is staying with them and the conference minister is doing the funeral. So thank you for all of your support. Thank you for being part of um, the work that we do for justice and welcome in this region. And thank you for your graciousness in allowing me to dash out at the end of the service. I will certainly be back, and I look forward to joining you for Brunch Church in a future week. Thanks so much. Thank you, Reverend Pryor. And speaking of babies, we have a baptism this morning. So I invite the Wellman family forward. Church, the promise of Christ's eternal presence in our lives is not only for us, but it is for the children of this community. Baptism is the mark of the acceptance of a child into the care of Christ's church, the sign and seal of their participation in God's grace and the beginning of their growth into full Christian faith and discipleship. So Dan and Karen... Do you desire that your child be baptized into the faith and family of Christ? If so, say, we do. And will you, with God's grace, be Christ's disciples, following in the way of our Savior, resisting evil, showing love and justice, and witnessing the work of Jesus Christ as best as you are able? If so, say, we will with the help of God. And will you, with God's grace, Help this child be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus by celebrating Christ's presence, by furthering Christ's mission in all the world, and by offering the nurture of the Christian Church so that he may affirm his baptism. If so, say, we will with the help of God. And congregation, all those watching here and the sanctuary and also online, I want you to know that Christ calls us to make disciples of all nations. And so do you who witness and celebrate this sacrament, 
promise to guide and nurture this child by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging him to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of Christ's church. If so, say, we will. We will. Friends, this water is ordinary. It came straight from the tap. But our God has a way of taking ordinary elements like water and bread and wine, ordinary people like you and like me, and ordinary events like the birth of a baby and doing extraordinary things. Most extraordinary of all, of course, are the promises that God makes to each one of us, promises of love and grace and forgiveness and the promise to be with us from our very first breath to our very last breath and beyond. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for the gift of baptism. Before the world was formed, your spirit moved over the waters. From the waters of the deep, you brought forth all life. In the time of Noah, you washed the earth with flood waters, offering us your ark of salvation. In the time of Moses, you led your people across the waters of the Red Sea, from slavery to freedom, and across the waters of the Jordan River into the Promised Land. In the fullness of time, you came to us in the person of Jesus Christ, who was nurtured in the water of Mary's womb. He was baptized by John in the waters of the Jordan, became living water to the Samaritan woman at the well, washed the feet of his disciples, and sends us forth now to baptize all nations by water and the Holy Spirit. Pour out your spirit that through these baptismal waters, this child may be empowered to preach good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, and free all who are oppressed. Thanks be to you, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Please state for the congregation this child's full Christian name. Soren Deal Wellman. Soren Deal Wellman. You want me to hold him? Okay, let's do it. Yeah. Soren Deal Wellman. I baptize you in the name of our creator, in the name of our redeemer, and in the name of our sustainer. Soren, child of the covenant, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. Okay, time for the baby parade. <laughs> Best part our of the Our favorite part. Favorite part. Church, this is the newest member of our faith community. Soren does not yet know the joy of celebration or the fear of failure or the sting of heartbreak. He does not yet know the brokenness of our world or the stories of Jesus Christ. And so as a member of our covenant family, on behalf of the wider faith community, it is our shared responsibility to teach him about God and to show him the power of a love that will never let him go through good times and hard times. It is our shared responsibility to teach him how to listen and follow our still-speaking God. Amen. Please join me in welcoming our newest member of this faith community. You did good, Soren. <laughs> Such joy. Friends, at this time, I invite you to stand as you are able and proclaim with me our church's covenant of faith. In response to God's creating, redeeming, and sustaining love, we unite for the worship of God and the service of all. We seek to know the will of God and to walk in God's ways made known in Jesus Christ, to love one another, to proclaim the gospel to all the world, to work and pray for peace and justice, and to live in harmony with all creation. We trust the presence of the Holy Spirit in trial and rejoicing, and the promise of eternal life both now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you.
I invite you to share signs of peace with one another. If you're worshiping online, I invite you to type in the chat a moment when you experienced Christ's peace this week. And at this time, I invite our young friends to come forward. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Oh, one more time. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. <laughs> I'm so glad you're all here. I have another fun story for us this week. So everyone scooch in and listen closely. There was a big group of people called the Israelites. They were living in Egypt, and things were really hard for them. They had to work very, very hard, and they barely got any rest. One day, their brave leader, Moses, everyone say Moses. Moses, Moses helped them leave Egypt. They were so excited to start a new adventure. But then they reached a huge, scary sea called the Red Sea. Everyone say the Red Sea. And guess what? When they got to the Red Sea, the soldiers from Egypt were behind them, chasing them. So imagine this. You're standing in front of the Red Sea. The Red Sea's in front of us. And then the soldiers from Egypt are behind us, chasing us. We're pretty scared, right? Yeah, everyone make your best scared face. Show me how you're really, really scared. Yeah, good. We're, we're scared. We're scared. But guess what? Here's where the story gets really exciting. God told Moses to hold up his stick over the sea. So let's pretend that we're Moses and hold up your stick. Everyone hold up your stick for a moment. Now picture this. As Moses is holding up his stick, the water of the Red Sea parts. It splits apart. <laughs> Can we imagine that? There's a dry path right in the middle of the sea. The Israelites were able to walk straight across. And when they got across, the water went back together. So the soldiers chasing them couldn't get across. And the Israelites were safe. This story is so special because it shows how people who were in a tough situation found a way to be free and happy. It's a story that many people have loved and shared for a long, long time reminding us that even when things are hard, there's always hope and a way to be happy again. So when you have a big problem or you're feeling really stuck, remember how God helped Israelites find their way. You're never alone. There's always hope and a way to get through. Let's pray. God, we thank you for always being with us. Help us to have hope when we feel stuck or scared. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. All right, we are off to Sunday school upstairs or back with your grown up. time I invite our ushers to come forward to collect this morning's offering and I believe it is our youth today. Um, I just wanted to read you all a Google review that was left about our church two days ago, a couple days ago. Uh, the, the person said, Leviticus 18.22, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. 
this church should not be supporting LGBTQ++. And uh, Jacob and I wrote in response to that, we proudly consider this a five-star review because we are committed to welcoming and celebrating our LGBTQ plus siblings and anyone who comes through our doors. So, we just wanted to celebrate that five-star review with you and also thank you for being a part of this community which is openly committed to making sure that everyone who walks through our doors is in fact welcome. And if you so choose, we invite you to go on Yelp or Google or Facebook and leave a five-star review of your own to support this church. Thank you for being a part of this community and this ministry.
We give with joyful hearts today, loving God, knowing how much joy our shared resources will create. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from the book of Exodus chapter 14. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the minds of Pharaoh and his officials were changed toward the people, and they said, what have we done letting Israel leave our service? So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 elite chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the Israelites who were going out boldly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, his chariot drivers and his army. They overtook them, camped by the sea, by pi Harahoth in front of baal Zephon. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone so that we can serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the heart of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots and his chariot drivers. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his chariot drivers. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord, in the pillar of fire and cloud, looked down on the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into a panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers and the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. I am sure that there are people here in the sanctuary and watching online who could not care any less about sports, my wife being one of them. But regardless if we would be hard-pressed to tell the difference between a home run and a slam dunk, there are certain sports figures in history that have left such a cultural mark that we all have to know about them. 
people across the world would be able to identify the gentleman in this picture here, Michael Jordan, of course, flying through the air. Are there no pictures? Oh, no. You can imagine Michael Jordan floating through the air with his tongue hanging out. I know you know that image. We would also be able to recognize Simone Biles, who has been christened the GOAT, the greatest of all time, because not only is she the most decorated gymnast in history, and not only did she start really important conversations around mental health and sports, but she has five moves named after her because she was the first person to ever do them. So you can watch Simone Biles doing the Simone Biles. Serena Williams, we all know Serena Williams, one of the most decorated tennis stars of all time, who even nine months after giving birth, while suffering through postpartum complications, won another major title at the French Open. That is amazing. And I hope at this point, you all would be familiar with my hometown hero, Patrick Mahomes who, mark my words, will lead Kansas City to the first ever three-peat championship in football history on February 9th, 2025. Circle the date on your calendars. You heard it here, okay? And if you don't know Patrick, then maybe you know one of his teammates. And it's okay if you don't know his name either. You can just call him Taylor Swift's boyfriend. <laughs> and everyone will know who you're talking about. Now, I totally understand people who find the violent nature of sports like football or boxing distasteful, but no matter our feelings on that topic, I hope that we all at least have some knowledge of what was termed at the time the fight of the century on July 4th, 1910. A boxer by the name of Jack Johnson was the heavyweight champion of the world, the first time a black individual ever held that title. In response, there was an undefeated boxer by the name of Jim Jeffries who was coaxed out of retirement to try to wrench that title away from Johnson. The author Jack London of Call of the Wild fame called Jeffries the chosen representative of the white race and this time the greatest of them. He even coined the term the great white hope to describe Jeffries. The goal of the fight was to prove that black people were unworthy of the same distinctions as their white counterparts, with a New York Times editorial even saying, if the black man wins, thousands and thousands of his ignorant brothers will misinterpret the victory as justifying claims to much more than physical equality with their white neighbors. Full equality just could not be fathomed. Now, Jeffries, the white fighter, was known for his enormous strength and stamina. He fought from a crouching position, and he would wear his opponent down until delivering the final left hook to win the fight. In all of his fights, he had never even been knocked down, let alone lost. Well, on the day of the fight, Jack Johnson dominated. He knocked Jeffries down a total of three times before Jeffries' coaches decided to forfeit the match. His victory that day was about so much more than boxing. Jack Johnson didn't just defeat Jim Jeffries. A new narrative of black success defeated the old tire story of racial hierarchies. The same thing happened in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin when Jesse Owens won four track and field gold medals for the first time in Olympic history while Adolf Hitler watched from the stands in Berlin. His victories were not just about who could run the 100-meter dash the fastest or who could jump the furthest. They were signaling to Germany that the Fuhrer's belief in racial superiority was based on lies and signaling to his own country their moral hypocrisy that when he returned home from the Olympics, Jesse Owens would be subject to mistreatment as a black man in America. Our current sermon series is entitled, Retold, Sunday School Stories You Thought You Knew. 
and we're revisiting tales from the Bible that we may have learned about in Sunday school as children, but this time around we're taking a look at the more complicated aspects of the stories. And today we join the Hebrew people as they cross the Red Sea and their escape from Egypt. But like Jack Johnson versus Jim Jeffries or Jesse Owens versus his Olympic counterparts, this story is about so much more than Moses versus Pharaoh. When the Egyptians drown at the end of the story, our scripture is about so much more than the tribal warfare of Israelites versus Egyptians. But first, let's talk about some scholarly details that we may not have discussed in grade school. We have always known this story to be the crossing of the Red Sea. And in our imaginations, this is a really impressive feat because the Red Sea is one of the most famous and largest bodies of water in the area. But the original Hebrew text doesn't actually refer to the Red Sea. Instead, the Hebrew states that they crossed the Reed Sea, or the Sea of Reeds. The Red Sea didn't come into mistranslation until the King James Bible was written down in English thousands of years later. Now, scholars have identified several places in the Nile River Delta where there is an abundance of reeds that could have been the place that the Israelites crossed. If you're interested in proving the historicity of this story, it's actually important that it was the Reed Sea and not the Red Sea for a couple of reasons. In these smaller areas, there are actually geological phenomenon whereby winds can become strong enough in something called negative storm surges or wind set downs where the winds actually part the waters and the Israelites can walk across the sea on dry ground. So if you're looking for a scientific explanation for this story, that's one of them. Another reason crossing the Sea of Reeds is much more possible and plausible is just simple math. The book of Exodus tells us that there were 600,000 men in the Israelite camp, not including women and children. In a patriarchal society, that is how they counted people. If you know the story of Jesus feeding 5,000 people, if you look closely, it will tell you there were 5,000 men, not including women and children. So assuming that there is an equal number of women as there are to men, that would put the number at about 1.2 million people. And based on typical child population rates, that would mean about 1.5 million people. Now, more than likely, that number is grossly inflated. That would represent half of the population of Egypt, which at the time was two to three million people. So if half the population of a country left the country at one time, that would not quite be possible. We have seen plenty of people in today's political landscape inflate crowd size numbers. <laughs> so we know that it can be done pretty easily. But imagine 1.5 million people attempting to walk across the Red Sea, which at its narrowest spot is 50 to 70 miles. That would take days at a time, and the Egyptian army would absolutely catch up to the Israelites. The Hebrew word translated as thousands can also be translated as clans. So the most likely scenario here is not that 600,000 men crossed the Red Sea, but that 6,000, or I'm sorry, 600 clans or a few tens of thousands of people crossed a much smaller Reed Sea. That is your Bible 201 lesson for the day. There will be a pop quiz. You can grab it on your way out to make sure you tracked all that. Now, no matter how many people we're talking about, no matter what body of water we're crossing here, that doesn't change the fact that the crossing of the Reed Sea and the exodus from Egypt becomes the, capital T, capital H, capital E, the main story of the Hebrew people. They will make it a requirement within their community to retell the story of the escape from Egypt and Pharaoh every year during the Passover celebrations, a tradition that continues until this very day. 
When God gives the Israelites the Ten Commandments, he will say, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt, out of captivity from slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. All the other laws find their basis in the story of the Exodus. How could you worship another god when this is the god who rescued you? The Israelites will be told that the reason they are to treat immigrants in their land with kindness is because they know what it's like to be in captivity in Egypt. And during times of suffering like the Babylonian exile, they will point to the story of the Exodus as evidence of the deliverance that comes from God even in the darkest times. Everything revolves around this story. The importance of the escape from Pharaoh within the Hebrew tradition is on par with the importance of the resurrection of Jesus as the central story of the New Testament. In fact, there's so many parallels between the two. When Jesus' body is placed in the tomb, there is nowhere for it to go. It is surrounded by the walls of a cave on three sides and the stone rolled in front of it on the fourth. When the Israelites flee from Egypt, they are surrounded by Pharaoh's army on one side and the Reed Sea on the other. In both situations, it seems as if there's no escape. That's the end of the line. That's all, folks. In the lectionary, where biblical texts are assigned to be read on specific days, the story of the crossing of the Reed Sea is supposed to be read on the night of the Easter Vigil. So we remember Jesus' crucifixion on Good Friday. We celebrate Christ's resurrection on Easter Sunday. But on Saturday night, we are supposed to keep watch to find out, will Jesus stay dead or will something miraculous happen instead? Notice the language in our passage when the Israelites come up against the sea. They are told, do not be afraid, stand firm, and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. They are to keep vigil, to wait and see. Will God abandon them so soon after leaving Egypt? Or will something miraculous occur instead? And just as the Exodus story is not about Moses versus Pharaoh, the resurrection is not about Jesus versus the Roman occupiers who put him to death. When Jesus emerges from the tomb, it is a declaration that death is not the end of the story, that life will always triumph and that love will win, that the forces represented by the Romans will not be victorious. So too, when the waters of the Red Sea come crashing down over Pharaoh's army, the message reverberates beyond this provincial area to proclaim universally that oppressors will not ultimately prevail, that the forces of darkness and destruction and death will be held accountable, that systems that bind and enslave and hold captive will be broken which is why the story of the Exodus has been lifted up by oppressed people across cultures and across time, including those wrongfully enslaved in our own country, to believe that freedom will come. When I think about the forces of destruction and oppression today, the list is long. I think about Hamas perpetrating acts of terrorism to instill fear in Jewish populations around the world. I think about the Israeli government's occupation of Palestine and how they have pursued policy of settlement, occupying Palestine and pushing innocent people out of their homes long before this current conflict. I think about the people of Ukraine fighting for their homeland for almost three years now. I think about ethnic minorities in Burma being exterminated while our news channels are silent. I think about the federal minimum wage being $7.25 since 2009, 15 years, while inflation has increased the cost of everything from food to houses many times over. Can you imagine making $7.25 an hour? It's criminal. It's sinful. I think about the billion dollar corporations who pay their employees that minimum wage. I think about families drowning in medical debt or people who can't seek medical care because they know they can't afford it. I think about state legislators banning gender affirming care because uh, they are opposed to trans individuals while suicide rates of trans teens 
are astronomical. But the forces of death and destruction will not win. I don't know how they will be defeated. I don't know when they will be defeated. But I do believe that ultimately freedom from oppression will come. It will always come. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And it bends because we are called not just to witness the work of God, but like Moses, to stretch our arm over the seas of chaos and join the work. You all know that I don't personally believe in a literal hell, but I love a quotation about hell from C.S. Lewis where he says this, No one is in hell involuntarily. To be in hell is to sit in a jail cell with the door wide open and refuse to leave. We don't just sit in vigil anymore because, church, we know the end of the story. We know that Christ rises, that death has been conquered, that the armies of Pharaoh have been defeated. But humanity has created our own hells here on earth, and it is our job to declare that the doors to freedom are open, and together we must walk through them. The sad reality, though, is that it is so easy for us to get caught up in the same systems of oppression, especially the economic disparities in our country. Sometimes we sit in the jail cell ourselves because the comforts of our privilege seem too nice to give up. Or sometimes our work for justice creates the same violence that we're trying to stop. Thankfully, the grace of God extends to all of humanity, even the oppressors. The ancient rabbis told a story that the angels in heaven decided to sing a song of praise before God when the armies of Pharaoh had been defeated. And God responded by saying, My handiwork, the Egyptians, are drowning in the sea. How can you recite a song before me? God mourns for everyone who is wrapped up in destruction when what God desires is for everyone to flourish with life. The danger of religion is to think that it separates us into good people and bad people when in reality we are all complicit for the hells that we have created here on earth. But the grace of God is enters into every place, every conflict, every war, every person. There is no hell that the grace of God has not flooded into. And so it is with that grace that we can declare alongside the story of the escape from Egypt and the story of the resurrection that when it seemed as if there was no way out, a path forward appeared. The gates of freedom stood wide open. And so there is nothing that can hold us captive, whether in our personal lives, our depression or anger or apathy or doubt, or on a global scale, racism, homophobia, genocide or war, because God has already opened the gates to freedom and it is our job to help the world walk through it. Amen?
Friends, join me in prayer. I will issue the call. We pray together, and you're invited to join me in a response. Free us, O oh God. Let us pray. Liberating God, when we cry out for help, you hear us. When we seek your comfort, you hold us. When we work for justice, you inspire us. And when we lose our way, you guide us. Hear our prayers this morning as we turn to you and move toward true freedom, hope, and wholeness. We pray together, free us, O oh God. We pray for those among us who are in need of personal liberation from substance abuse, from anxiety and depression, from disordered eating, from queer phobia, from self-loathing and self-doubt, and from closed-mindedness. We pray together, free us, O oh God. We name that it is not always easy to follow your ways in the face of cruelty, prejudice, tension, and conflict. We pray for the courage to be Christ's hands and feet in our broken world, caring for one another through hard times, lifting one another up along our journey, and always speaking words of peace and hope to our neighbors. We lift up in prayer difficult situations, strained relationships, hard conversations that need to be had, and boundaries that need to be established. We pray together, free us, O oh God. We pray for institutions that need to be freed from the past so that new life and new joy can bloom. We lift up in prayer our country, our government, the global church, and our own faith community. We pray together, free us, O oh God. We say all of these words with one heart and one voice and one mind using the words you teach us, praying, God of all, who made the heavens and the earth, your name is perfect and complete. Help us to be trustworthy with your creation. Help us to trust in this life and in the life after. Empower us to attain our physical and psychological needs and free us from the wants of our privilege. Forgive our failure to understand others and their needs, and grant us the ability to forgive when we are misunderstood. Free us from that which separates us from you, but help us to seek your still speaking voice, because you are our community, our resilience, and our future in all ways and at all times. Let it be. Amen.
gorgeous music today, as always. Thank you to our hammer dulcimer players and our choir. Um, Church, just a really quick personal update. We've kind of kept you up to speed on our IVF journey. So we had one retrieval that failed miserably. We had a second retrieval two months ago um, where we did get one embryo that's viable for transfer that's on ice right now. Um, our doctor wants us to do another retrieval to get a backup before we move to the transfer phase. So we've got to go back up to our clinic in San Francisco, and the timing of it is happening on a Sunday again. So we're probably going to be gone unless something changes. We're going to be gone next Sunday up in San Francisco again. So thanks for your patience and support on this journey. We really appreciate all the love that you have shown to us um, as we take this adventure together. Um, and for all of us, we will leave this space today with the grace of God infused in our lives. May we take that grace, live in that grace, and join Moses and all of our spiritual ancestors to do the work of bringing the freedom and peace of God into this world. Amen. <laughs>